Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Okay, mic's on, fantastic. Uh, yeah, my name's Katie Fenn, um, and this afternoon I'm going to speak to you about memory and all the work that JavaScript and web browsers do behind the scenes to manage memory for us. I work for a company called NPM. I keep JavaScript packages running to your browser. Please don't break it. Um, I, I love working for NPM. It's a fantastic bunch of people. You can find me on Twitter at Katie underscore Fem. Please tell me what you think of my talk afterwards. I'd love to hear whether I've lived up to that introduction. And just in case large animations and videos make you feel sick or uncomfortable, um, a Content warning will appear in the bottom right-hand corner on the slides before they occur. I have about five video, no, six videos or large animations on my slides, and they're further on in the talk. So, memory is fundamentally important. It's, it's really important for running our applications and our websites. It's a finite resource. We can't just produce more of it or add more to it to our laptop whenever we need it. And as devices, new devices are given more memory, um, our apps discover ever more creative ways of consuming it again. And in the last 10 years, we've seen a really big change in the way that we design our websites. Smartphones have become the most popular way of browsing the web. And if you have it, relatively new phone, uh, iPhone 6, um, you'll know that, it, it, you might know it has two gigabytes worth of memory, which is a lot less than what my laptop has, which has 16 gigabytes of memory. And that's just the high-tech tip of the iceberg, if we just, as we just seen with Blaine's talk. If you go and look at the kind of devices that are used in the developing world, you might find much, much less. So it's a very constrained resource. As developers, we're often told that memory is important, but the truth is that JavaScript does a remarkable job of managing it for us. Now, this is my copy of JavaScript, The Definitive Guide. It's a huge book. It has over a 1,000 pages, and it's the, it really is the definitive guide on pretty much everything to do with JavaScript. But if you look up memory in the index of this book, it comes up on just one page. And in fact, it's only mentioned in just one paragraph. And it reads, the programmer never needs to worry about deallocation of objects. The interpreter automatically reclaims memory. So how does JavaScript do this? Well, I want to take you behind the scenes to show you how. So before we can answer that, we need to think about what memory is and why it's needed. Well, memory is used to store the most important instructions and data used by our applications on the computer at a given moment. And this is the world famous Colossus computer that was famously used at Bletchley Park to decode enemy messages during the Second World War. And if you wanted, to reprogram this computer. You can't just type into a keyboard. You'd physically have to unplug wires and plug them in a different place and rewire the machine. And you might think, I can see a tape on the right-hand side. That's where the program is, right? That's where the data for all those messages is fed into the machine. So it is very, very fast to crunch data but it was very slow and inconvenient to reprogram. Memory was introduced later into computers, and these first so-called stored program computers could actually reprogram themselves to um, do different things on <coughs> while they were going. And this is what memory looks like inside a desktop computer. This is called RAM. And it plugs into the, um, into the motherboard on these sticks called DIMMs. And the actual memory is held on little chips on these sticks. And RAM is really lightning fast at reading and writing data, which makes it perfect for storing the most important things, the most important data that's being used by application. 
Now, browsers allocate this memory on our behalf, and the areas of memory that it manages are called heaps. Absolutely everything that is on screen used by our web pages, or the HTML, or the CSS, images, JavaScript, videos, fonts, are all held in memory. And inside our web browsers, they um, allocate a heap within a heap just for the JavaScript data that our JavaScript is using. And when our page loads in the browser or when JavaScript creates variables, the heap grows in size and memory is allocated for those variables for those things. And when JavaScript objects are discarded or we navigate away to another page, the heap shrinks and memory is deallocated again. So these are the processes that JavaScript has to manage for us. And JavaScript allocates memory for us when we declare variables. And once variables are declared, we can assign values into that memory and start using the memory that's been allocated for us. Now this, we typically call this the equal sign, but to give it its proper name, this is the assignment operator, and it assigns values to the variable. But in fact, all these operators assign memory, and you can even use methods um, to assign memory. There's lots of different ways that you can do it, but essentially, it all works the same way. It takes a value from the right-hand side and then assigns it to a memory address described by the variable name on the left. Now, JavaScript uses something called scopes to deallocate memory. If the heap is a farm, then a scope is a field. We use, mem we use scopes to break memory up, to make, group it into smaller bits that we can manage. And that allows us to do things like reusing variable names and to protect values, protect va variables from being written to by other functions. But crucially for JavaScript's memory management, scopes capture variables and values defined around them and then makes them available for use inside those functions. And when a function has run its course, when we've called it, and it's done its work, and, it, um, and the, the function call ends, its scope ends as well. And any variables that are only used by that scope um, are not needed anymore, and the memory used by them can then be reclaimed. Variables are only retained as long as their parent scope exists, and understanding scopes is the key to understanding how JavaScript manages memory. We'll come back and speak about more on this later. So that's how you control memory in J JavaScript. That's how you start telling JavaScript your intentions Let's start going behind the scenes to see how JavaScript works and actually manages the, mem the, the memory as a physical resource. JavaScript belongs to a family of languages called garbage collected languages. And really, if you boil that down, it just means that JavaScript does a lot of work that you don't have to worry about. The easiest way to explain garbage collection is to contrast it with almost the opposite, with manual mem management. Um, this is a line of C code. C is a programming language, and it belongs to a family of ma manual memory managed languages. And C is used to make a lot of software tools. And it gives you a lot of authority over resources, system resources, such as memory. So if you wanted to declare an array of 10 items, you can use the malloc function, and you can say, give me some memory the size of 10 integers here. And to free up that memory again, you can use the free function. You say, you pass in this reference and say, free up this memory. Now, this is a lot of control over your memory, but it's also an awful lot of work. If you wanted to expand this array and add more items to it, you would have to go through this cycle again. You'd have to allocate memory and free it up again. 
you also have to keep very, very close track of all the data that's in your system. So you have to have an exquisite knowledge of everything that your, everything that your software is doing. And garbage collection is designed to take care of this for you. So the garbage collector is not made up of just one action, but many. And it's designed to manage the different kinds of data that normally inhabit your heap. Memory is divided up into two areas. The young generation, which is itself divided up into two sections called semi-spaces, and the old generation. Now, most variables that we create in JavaScript are short-lived. We create them, we use them for a purpose, and then we discard them very, very quickly. And the young generation is designed to take maximum advantage of that, making that process fast without holding your application up. And that means all new variables are created inside the young generation. And they're created here in half megabyte pages. Storing variables and pages makes managing memory more efficient and it allows the garbage collector to grow and shrink the size of the heap efficiently. And when the first, um, the first section or semi-space fills up, um, a minor garbage collection begins. Objects that aren't needed or um, uh, objects that aren't needed anymore are discarded. So how does JavaScript know which objects in your system are being used and which objects aren't. All the objects in memory are linked together by references. You, ha you have one object that's holding the hand of another and say, I'm using this. And it's a bit like a family tree where you can trace the members of your family by following the relationships. And JavaScript can trace objects through this tree using those references. When objects are deleted or overwritten or a function is called and it comes to an end, some of those references will be cut and some of those objects will become unreachable as a result. Any objects that can be traced are considered alive and some of those objects that can't be traced will be considered dead. When all the objects die, that whole page can be discarded. Discarding whole pages is one way that the garbage collector can be really efficient. So a minor garbage collection takes as little as one millisecond. It's very, very good at its job. And the more data is discarded, the more efficient job, uh, uh, garbage collection is. And any pages with any live data remaining are then moved to the next semi-space, and the whole process begins again. Any pages that survive two minor garbage collections are then moved to the old generation. The old generation is kind of like the opposite of the young generation. It's designed for much longer lived data, and it's designed to hold more of it as well. And it can expand to an arbitrary size. That's good because often a lot of the really important data in our applications, things such as settings, often end up here. And when this grows large enough, a major garbage collection begins. The major garbage collection collector uses a mark sweep compact garbage, collect garbage collection. And it does this to efficiently manage the sort of data that ends up in the old generation. Chrome's garbage collector marks dead objects to be collected. So any objects that aren't used anymore, they're, um, they're unreachable, will be marked up and will say, this needs to be um, reclaimed all this memory. And it uses a similar tracing process as the minor garbage collection to find out which date, which objects are alive, and which objects have died. Memory is then swept by sweepers that run in the background. And 
then they make memory ready for use again. Memory is compacted throughout this process to make a more efficient use of memory, to make sure that there's enough memory in your system to be used by everything else. A quick note about performance, about how some browsers are um, uh, making performance optimizations. Um, marking can block your application. Some processes marking can, make, um, can mean that your application isn't doing things like responding to user input or scrolling or, won't, um, or you won't be able to input um, stuff into forms. And marking a large heap can take 100 milliseconds. So really, browsers really need to work hard in order to keep your applications responsive. Now, V8, which is Google Chrome's implementation of JavaScript, breaks this up into one millisecond chunks, so your applications can keep being responsive. And V8 has re recently added concurrent marking, allowing 70 to 80 percent of this marking to happen in the background, so your application can keep running. I wanted to say something about WebAssembly. WebAssembly is a really exciting advent of a new relationship with memory and with performance in the browser that's coming up in the future. WebAssembly is a way of running languages other than JavaScript to work alongside JavaScript in the browser. And it allows you to use a compiler to compile code written in languages such as C, C++, or Rust, or many other languages in the future to work in the browser. And I know many, there must be many people in this room who've wanted to use a language other than JavaScript. Compiling languages like C opens the door to running much more high-performance applications in the browser, just like this 3D demo that was produced by Mozilla and Epic that uses the Unreal Engine. You might have heard the Unreal Engine before. It's used to make countless video games on PCs and consoles that animate complex 3D scenes such as this. So if you can see the blossom coming off the tree, if you can see the reflections coming off the pool, that's precisely the sort of thing that is now possible with WebAssembly in web browsers. And just one of the things that makes this possible is that WebAssembly applications have ownership over their own memory. This allows more efficient manual memory management to take place, free of the influence of JavaScript's garbage collector. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time to take a deep dive into WebAssembly, but I really highly encourage you to have a look at this talk by Lynn Clark at JSConf EU this year. She goes into WebAssembly in really great detail, and it is a fantastic talk. Definitely give it a watch. So actual problems with memory, they can be classified loosely into two different problems, memory bloat and memory leaks. So how do you know that you have a problem? When your Chrome tab crashes and you see this page here, it could be unresponsive JavaScript locking your browser up, but it could also be the garbage collector. You've bloated your page so much that the garbage collector gives up and says, I can't do this anymore. And on Safari on iOS, it looks like this. You're using an application that is bloating up the browser, slowing it down. You try and scroll up and down, and it's not working. That video should be running. And eventually, it just gives up and says, this tab had to be reloaded and because, because a problem occurred. So um, memory bloat is when we make unnecessarily large websites for the purpose that they serve. All the HTML, the CSS, the web fonts, the videos, the JavaScript code, are all stored in memory and contribute to your application's footprint. Opening Chrome, um, 
the Chrome Task Manager shows us how much memory each of our tabs consume. You can, oh, I'll cut that off a bit. So if you go into the menu, you can select more tools, you can click our Task Manager, and it will crunch through the memory and it will show you how much each tab is using. Really helpfully, it also breaks down the memory that's used just to display the things on page or the HTML and the CSS. And it also shows the size of the JavaScript heap as well. So you can start to think about, do I have a problem with just memory bloat or is it caused by um, a memory leak in JavaScript? A baseline consumption for a Hello World application that just shows Hello World on page, doesn't have any CSS, it doesn't have any JavaScript, absolutely nothing at all other than a headline, is around 100, 100 megabytes. That's just the overhead of any kind of web page. It's not just this. That's for any web page at all. And the, um, the JavaScript heap is about three... Uh, three kilobytes as well, and that's just the minimum, need, minimum amount needed to make JavaScript's APIs accessible. A really crowded web page might consume 500 megabytes, and that might not be an issue on a desktop like this that has 16 gigabytes worth of memory, but that's a quarter of the amount of memory used by this. And as we saw with Bruce and Addy's talk, Bloating your web page can really start to cause significant problems, and you really shouldn't do it. You should only use the amount of memory that's needed to serve the purpose of your application. So don't bloat your web pages, optimize your images and your content. Now, when JavaScript code continually adds more and more data to the heap than it discards that data, that's a classic sign that you have a memory leak. And memory leaks are caused by code mistakes in your JavaScript that, present, that prevent that data from dying off. Or if this is your data and you thought it was dead and gone and wasn't a problem anymore, this is you thinking, oh, no, I've got a memory leak. So you can study memory leaks using the Performance tab in Chrome DevTools. So you can open that and you can click on Record, you can interact with your web page and trying to get it to recreate those problems. You hit record again, and it will show you this graph here. Now, this graph, the line goes up whenever the memory is allocated, and the memory goes back down again whenever that memory is freed, and it shows you the size of the heap at a point in time. And when the heap size is larger on the right-hand side than it is on the left, that is a classic sign that you have a memory leak, that de um, data is being added to the heap and it's not being um, released again. So how, how does this start happening? Well, accidental globals is one sort of mistake that causes this. Variables in the global scope are very, very long-lived. They last for the lifetime of your application because at any point, well, in, at the point that your, your, your uh, web page is open, those variables might be needed, so they can't be automatically um, discarded by JavaScript. And this illustrates just how easily global variables can be created. Because the results variable is declared without a var keyword, that data is created in the global scope. So it's always a good idea to use a linter, such as JSHint or ESLint, to spot some of these mistakes, or to use um, JavaScript's strict mode that prevents these things from happening. So scoping variables is very, very important. And after fixing that scoping, we can f um, the garbage collector can free up that memory after the function is finished. We can see now that the graph is lower on the right-hand side than it is on the left. That's a good sign. Uh, other kinds of scopes that create long-lived data, timers and intervals also have access to the variables inside their parent scopes. And these variables are needed whenever the timers are active. 
and the variables in their scopes will stay alive as a consequence. And this graph shows a memory leak swelling the size of the heap on every tick of the timer. This is not every any um, event timer in any application. This is mine. This is mine. It's deliberately crafted to um, abuse the, the heap and add loads and loads of data to it, and we can see that effect that it's having. When we clear that timer, when we use um, uh, remove timeout or um, unset timeout and unset, I can't remember which one, if we remove those timers, the scope ends and that memory is freed again. Event listeners are also scopes that capture those variables in the scopes around them, just like timers do. And this example program deliberately generates a really large string um, whenever the button is pushed. And the scope around that, um, that event handler keeps that variable alive. And as long as that event listener is active, the scope is kept alive and those variables can't be freed again. So removing unneeded event listeners allows that memory to be freed up. <coughs> a really common source of memory leaks are orphaned DOM nodes. We use DOM nodes for creating and manipulating HTML elements that are shown on page, on screen. And this script generates lots and lots of detached DOM nodes, which are absolutely useless unless they're added to the DOM tree and shown on screen. If you can't see them, they are relatively useless. Now, Chrome DevTools can help us find these orphan DOM nodes by taking a memory snapshot. You can open the memory tab in Chrome DevTools, and you can click record, and it will take a survey of all the objects that are in your heap. And it will show you a list of all these objects, and you can filter it by detached, and it will show you a list of all the detached DOM nodes. And if you click on some of these, you can start to see um, clues about where these objects can be found. And in this case, by clicking on it, we can see that all these objects are stored inside an array called buttons in the global window scope. So we can start to look for clues about where these memory leaks are being created. So in summary, memory is a finite resource. It can only be used freed and then reused again. And we have to be good citizens. And JavaScript helps us do that. It helps us do that by managing memory on our behalf. And it does a lot of work that other languages have to do manually. The garbage collector frees up memory that's not being used. Memory bloat is when websites are unnecessarily large for the purpose that they serve. And memory leaks are when unused memory can't be freed again, and our scripts gradually swell the size of the heap. Finally, use DevTools to confirm your problems. They are your friend, and they are very, very powerful. Now, as I said earlier, I work for a company called NPM, and if you like our Wombat mascot as much as I do, I have some special edition Seaside FFConf Wombat stickers for your laptop. Sadly, I don't have enough for everyone. I have about 40 for today, so if you want to come and um, get one of these, come and see me in the break after my talk, and we'll see if we can distribute those out. So, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. A special thanks to Mate um, Matthias and the v uh, V8 Goog um, garbage collection team. They gave me lots and lots of resources in order to do this talk, and they also gave me a technical check as well. So shout out to them, and thank you very much.